Well, welcome today. Um, as, as I mentioned just before, to the, my name is Trevor Bernard. I'm the director of the Wilberforce uh, Institute here at the University of Hull. Uh, and this, this webinar is part of our, a series we've been doing uh, this, this year, um, since, especially since September, uh, on various aspects to do, particularly with historical slavery. Uh, and we're particularly uh, delighted today to, to have uh, Professor John Coffey uh, of the University of Leicester, Professor of History at the University of Leicester, uh, who is talking on Abolitionist Diaries, Rethinking William Wilberforce, uh, which of course is something absolutely central uh, to the mission and purpose uh, of the Wilberforce Institute. Uh, John will tell you a little bit about how he managed to get from us uh, doing work on 17th century uh, religious history uh, in Britain, uh, particularly in England, uh, to looking at William Wilberforce. Uh, but just to say that he is uh, he's a very distinguished scholar uh, in two particular ways. Uh, the first is that he is a scholar who has uh, worked extensively on religion, particularly Protestant culture and Protestant descent uh, within the within the British and, and, and Brit Brit within Britain and the British wider world. Uh, he's the author of Early Modern Protestant Culture, Exodus and Liberation, uh, Deliverance Politics from John Calvin to Martin Luther King, uh, a great number of articles and chapters, and this year has, has been the editor of the Oxford History of Protestant dis Dissenting Traditions. Uh, the second string to his bow is that in addition to being a very distinguished historian, uh, he also is a very accomplished editor of major texts and major diaries, uh, which brings them to the Wilberforce Diaries, one which is, as, as Professor Coffey will, will tell us, uh, is one notorious uh, for its difficulty. Um, John has worked on the, the writings of Richard Baxter, a 17th century clergyman, which I think is uh, the, the volumes of that coming out with OUP very soon. Uh, and as I mentioned, he's the director of the William Wilberforce Diaries project, uh, which is a long project dealing with Wilberforce's diaries, uh, which is coming out on with OUP. So we'd like to welcome him to, to the Wilberforce Institute and to this webinar. Uh, just to mention in terms of in terms of housekeeping, uh, if we do welcome questions, uh, John is very, very delighted to 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 answer the questions you might have to, to hit them. If you could, in the chat function, which is on the right-hand box, you'll be able to find it, there's a chat function. If you could put your questions in there, uh, those questions then will be delivered by me uh, at the conclusion of, the, of, the, of, of John's talk. Uh, so we do welcome questions. Um, Nick, Nick Evans, who's a member of the Wilberforce Institute, uh, will reply to those questions that you give that, he, that you give him and and, um, and and answer any complications and queries. So it's a great pleasure to welcome John here, uh, and we look forward, John, to your talk uh, on an abolitionist diaries uh, rethinking William Wilberforce. Over to you, John. Thank you uh, so much, Trevor. It's it's great to be with you, if only virtually. It would be nice to be in in back in Hull. Uh, but really, really great to, to have this opportunity. And I'm very grateful to you and to the team at the Wilberforce Institute for the opportunity to present and talk about uh, the uh, the Wilberforce Diaries project. Now, I do have a PowerPoint, so hopefully uh, everyone can see that. I'll, I'll no doubt you'll, you'll let me know if I can't. Um, but I wanted to show you some of the images from um, uh, from the, the manuscript so you get a good idea of uh, what we're facing in terms of uh, the project. So I've got two aims today. Uh, one is to provide a, a basic overview or introduction to the Wilberforce diaries. Um, and the other is to begin thinking a bit about how they might be useful to historians of abolition. Um, these are an abolitionist diaries rather than abolition diaries. So they're different, I think, from the diaries of, say, Thomas Clarkson or William Dixon, which are devoted to chronicling their abolitionist labors. Wilberforce's diaries, uh, they're kept for the entirety of his life and they contain all kinds of things. But precisely for that reason, I'm going to argue that they, they are useful to historians of uh, abolition. So as Trevor Hinton, I come at this from a slightly uh, odd angle, uh, although I began uh, as an historian, uh, as an undergraduate, my earliest published work on the mid-Victorian period. Most of my work in the last 20 years or so has been on the, um, the 17th century, uh, particularly around the English Revolution, 
uh, and I've also been working for the last 10 years really with uh, a team under the leadership of Neil Keeble uh, to produce this big five volume edition of a 17th century memoir, which uh, Trevor mentioned, the Reliquiae Baxteriani. So it was really working on this scholarly edition that first uh, gave me the idea of, of working on the Wilberforce Diaries, because it seemed to me that the Wilberforce Diaries were um, one of the most interesting late Hanoverian texts that hadn't really been published and uh, edited. Um, and so for a number of years, uh, I've been in discussions with um, uh, John Wolfe, who wrote the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography uh, article on Wilberforce and the Clapham sect, uh, and also with Mark Smith of Oxford University. Uh, and we, we have a contract with Oxford University Press to produce uh, an edition of the um, diaries and journals of William Wilberforce. Uh, and recently we've been joined by Michael McMullen, who's working on the, uh, the religious journal, which is an important part of the diaries. Um, and we're very grateful to the Bodleian Library uh, for, for help and, and, and uh, permissions to, to work on this material and take photographs of it. Uh, and also to uh, Wilberforce House Museum in Hull uh, and Vanessa Sal Salter in particular for uh, giving us high digital, uh, high resolution digital images of uh, the, the volume of the diaries that's in Hull, um, which is the largest of the volumes as, as we'll see. Um, and the project's also been really helped along uh, in recent years, first of all, by seed corn funding from uh, the John Fell Fund at Oxford and from Leicester uh, University, and also from a couple of very generous donations, including one recently from an anonymous donor through the, the Leicester Philanthropic um, uh, team, uh, which has allowed us to bring some early career scholars uh, on board to help out for a period of time, uh, including David Manning and Gareth Atkins, and Anna Harrington, uh, who's working on the, the text. Uh, and Anna has recently completed her PhD on Wilberforce's parliamentary abolitionism. So at the moment, we do have a sort of team of people working on different aspects of this project. And we're hoping really that by uh, the spring, we'll be able to move on to stage two of the project, having established the text, to begin annotating it and uh, putting together the scholarly uh, apparatus. So we, we do have a, a, a Twitter account. So if anybody wants to follow us on, on Twitter, you're very welcome, where we, we tweet out some of our latest uh, findings. But what I want to do is to um, introduce the manuscripts to you um, and then talk a bit about the Wilberforce Sons and how they edited or extracted uh, uh, material from the diaries for their official life of William Wilberforce, uh, published in five volumes in 1838. Um, and then we'll think about how uh, a, a full edition of the diaries might be useful to historians of abolition. So here's the earliest portrait we have of Wilberforce as an adult, um, probably in the early 1780s, perhaps as, just as a, a very young MP. He's become MP for Hull, of course, uh, his hometown in 1780. Um, you see from this portrait, he is very much a fashionable young man about town. And the very first diary we have from him is his account of a journey from Cambridge, where he's just graduated, to the Lake District, which, of course, is the height of fashion, really, in, uh, in, in the 1770s, you know, a bit like traveling to Nepal or to uh, Bali in the 1960s. Uh, the Lake District is, is and the, the craze for the picturesque is just taking off the very earliest guidebooks to the lakes have just been published and Wilberforce makes several trips up there and even eventually leases a house on Windermere. And this particular journal uh, is nice and legible uh, as, as, as you can see. So this is the very earliest diary or journal that Wilberforce um, keeps. And then there's a gap in the early 1780s when he is uh, a young MP and it picks up again from the 1st of January 1783, um, just before his friend William Pitt, the younger, becomes prime minister. Um, and as you can see, this is a uh, difficult text, uh, often minuscule writing on a tiny notebook, which he keeps for a number of years through to uh, 1780. 
46. It's often quite cryptic, and this is a, a, a feature of Wilberforce's diary. He's very good at mentioning names, but doesn't always record the detail of conversations. So you will get entries such as uh, Saul Burke, he detained me for two hours, uh, but no description of the uh, the conversation, rather frustratingly. Um, but this is this is the earliest diary, and, and I guess it's one element of the diary is that it is a parliamentary diary. It does give you a clear idea of uh, how MPs uh, work and socialise and the circles in which uh, they're moving. And then if we move to 1789, we see something very, very different. Uh, Wilberforce is now keeping his diary on loose sheets, on folio sheets. Uh, and it comes after the watershed of his religious conversion in 1785-86. You can see him now trying to keep an account of his time, though he's, he's not been very successful in doing so on this particular uh, this particular month. Um, but there's a huge amount of detail here, and he's now using the diary as a religious journal, uh, not just as a parliamentary diary, a diary of, of daily um, events. But these folio sheets pose quite a challenge in terms of uh, transcription. By the middle of the 1790s, he's using a soft bound book, uh, which folds out and writing across the two pages. And as you can see, doing so in an extraordinarily cramped fashion um, and using uh, creating margins and, and writing uh, vertically in, in the margins and also keeping a record of when he rises and when he goes to bed and so on. So there's all sorts of things going on here, but it's very, uh, very, very dense. And then later in his career, it becomes somewhat easier. Um, so in particular, there is this big volume, uh, which is now in Wilberforce House, uh, which he keeps between 1814 and 1823. So for a decade. Um, and uh, it's a volume we've just finished going through. Alan's just finished going through this. And it is more legible, uh, still challenges. He uses numerous abbreviations and so on. The writing is still often uh, overlaps and is, is tricky to decipher, but it is, uh, it's, it's becoming somewhat easier in the latter part uh, of, um, of his life. And this is the biggest of the Wilberforce diaries. Um, it's got over 160,000 words in it. Um, so it's, it's full of interesting material on this uh, rather neglected phase of his career after 1814, the last sort of 10 years of his time as an MP. <clears throat> now, these are uh, private documents. Um, we know that for a couple of reasons. The first is they contain some very personal information uh, about Wilberforce's bowels, uh, about his uh, opium use, uh, his struggles with licentious thoughts as a, a young man, uh, his endless exasperation with his eldest son, William, who, of course, ends up bankrupting him uh, late in life. We even get flashes of anger occasionally, which are quite uncharacteristic of Wilberforce, uh, but one of the critics of the Sierra Leone colony uh, in the 1810s, Robert Thorpe, Wilberforce at one point in the diary describes him as that vile demon Thorpe. Um, so the Wilberforce who comes across in the diary is in some ways a more human figure, uh, a spikier, uh, but also more insecure figure than the, the more assured Wilberforce that you find in the official life put together by uh, his sons. They record that Wilberforce had um, marked some of the earlier diaries with an order for their destruction. Um, so he clearly never intended these to be read by others, we, but he started making an exception for his family. Uh, and this particular volume of the religious journal uh, you can see that it bears a note saying to be read by dearest B only. Uh, that B is his wife, Barbara. And by these 1820s, as he's thinking about uh, death and about how his life will be recorded and remembered, uh, he's starting to see two of his younger sons, Robert and uh, Samuel, as potential biographers. Both of them go to Oxford University. They do very well academically. Both of them become clergymen. Um, there's Robert on the left, who does most of the work on the diaries, I think. 
And then his brother, Samuel, who, who of course later becomes Bishop of Oxford, and is known as Soapy Sam for his habit of rubbing his hands together as he speaks. And you can see the, the punch cartoon depicting, depicting that. But the, 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 the diaries are bequeathed to Robert in Wilberforce's will. And it's Robert who works through them and, and is the principal person involved in the sort of extraction process. And they publish uh, the five volume life of Wilberforce in 1838, this, this enormous baggy book, uh, which is really a kind of compilation of extracts from Wilberforce's diaries and his uh, letters uh, held together by some narrative, uh, but not, not a ter terribly readable book as those of you who've dipped into it will, will know, but nevertheless one that's very useful because of the sheer amount of primary source material that's included uh, in it. And in a way, Wilberforce biographers and lots of other scholars have really relied on this five volume biography and on the two volumes of correspondence published by the Sons two years later. So those seven volumes give you lots of source material and uh, biographers have generally been quite content just to, to plunder, to source mine these, these volumes rather than going back to the manuscripts. One reason the manuscripts were not much used is that until the 1980s, most of them were held in, in family hands and were not readily accessible to scholars, though sometimes the family did give uh, biographers and other scholars uh, access to them for a period. The only volume that was really uh, available to, readily available to scholars was the one that found its way into Wilberforce House Museum in the early 20th century, uh, the Hull Diary as we know it affectionately. Uh, but otherwise, the manuscripts remained in the hands of the family and they were brought together in the 1970s by uh, a man called Cuthbert or Dennis Rangham. And he published, self-published, uh, an edition of the 1779 Lake District Journal. So that's the only part of the diaries that's been published in full. Um, and after his death, uh, the, the manuscripts go to the Bodleian. Um, and they're brought together then, and they're also microfilmed at that point. Though it's interesting that they're still, in the, in the 30 years since then, have been used very little. Uh, one exception to that is Anne Stott, whose who's work on Wilberforce Family and Friends uses the diaries quite extensively to get at Wilberforce's uh, domestic life and relationships. Uh, but otherwise, biographers have still tended to rely very heavily on the printed sources. And there's also been a tendency of historians to leave Wilberforce to popular biographers, uh, either to religious biographers who are attracted by his, his devotion um, or to political biographers like, of course, William Haig, uh, the former foreign secretary. He wrote the most popular recent biography of uh, Wilberforce in Britain. Now, I want to argue that the, the neglect of the manuscripts was uh, a mistake and that actually um, we really need to go behind the five volume biography uh, to, to look at the original, the original text. So I want us to think a bit about the, the extraction process, if you like, that Robert Wilberforce engaged in in the 1830s. Now, one thing they did was make a lot of the diary available uh, in, in the official life. So, um, they published over 100,000 words from the diaries, uh, which you know, has been very useful to historians. So they did make a lot of material available. And to be fair to them, they, they never invented material. They didn't fabricate material, they, they, they selected. But as you can see from this particular chart, um, they never took more than 20% from an from a individual volume. So 80% or 90% in some cases, or sometimes even more for the, the diaries later in Wilberforce's life, um, was left unpublished. So there's a hu huge amount of material beneath the tip of the iceberg, if you like, that they never, uh, they never printed. Moreover, they had their own um, agendas. Uh, it's important to recognize that Robert Wilberforce in particular, but to some extent Samuel as well, had diverged somewhat from their father, both ecclesiastically and politically. 
um, they'd become rather especially uh, drawn into uh, the, the Oxford movement and eventually Robert will become Roman Catholic. So they've moved away from sort of low church evangelical Anglicanism of Wilberforce, uh, which allowed him to forge all kinds of relationships with dissenters. They have a much more negative view of religious dissent. Um, and similarly, they are, Wilberforce himself says uh, late in his life that his Oxonians, in other words, his sons uh, have become violent Tories. So whereas he had always staked out this status as an independent uh, and tried to collaborate quite extensively with Whigs as well as, of course, with Pittites, um, the sons are, are more politically conservative. And that influences the, their selections. Um, and you can see really from this particular page how the Wilberforce sons, uh, or how Robert has um, worked with uh, the manuscript diary because he goes through and he underlines passages. So you can see quite a lot of passages here underlined in red or brown ink. We know that these are later interventions by Robert because they correspond almost directly to the extracts in the 1838 uh, official life. So Robert goes through systematically all the diaries and underlines and marks sometimes in the margin with either pen or pencil uh, passages that can be extracted and used. And he even leaves little notes for himself, summarizing some of the contents, such as Prince of Wales and Pitt and the King and John Wesley and King's Letter and so on. Um, so he is the kind of key figure, uh, I think, in terms of uh, the extraction process. And it does lead to interesting omission so it's it, the, the work that they do is is um uh, as i said not fabrication but they do omit key passages and i'll just give you a couple of uh, examples of this oh, sorry um so here, here we've got a passage from uh, 1789 uh, where uh, you can see the underlinings that, that Robert, I think, has, has done here, uh, and they correspond with what's published in 1838. Um, I must make a thorough reform, uh, more solitude, etc., etc., earlier hours, diligence, uh, proper distribution and husbandry of time, associating with religious friends. And then in brackets, there's something that's been left out, uh, and it's the words J. Wesley, John Wesley. Uh, who at that time is still a Church of England minister, but the, the Methodists, of course, are just split away from the church and become dissenters. So the, the sons are dropping the reference to a very famous figure, to John Wesley, uh, because I think of discomfort with Wilberforce's numerous connections with religious uh, dissenters. I'll take another example, and this is one of the things that, of course, gets them into trouble with their uh, life in 1838. It leads to a famous dispute with Thomas Clarkson, who feels rightly slighted uh, and written out of the story of the, the early abolitionist movement in particular. Um, and you can see here what they did with, uh, with Clarkson and how they downplayed Clarkson's role. They did mention Clarkson, especially in 1788 and 1789, the once French Revolution breaks out, Clarkson tends to sort of fall away. Um, but even here, they're omitting critical uh, passages. So, for example, they omit Wilberforce's uh, admission that he's been too free in mentor or too free at the table. You know, to, he's et too much. He's been too indulgent. They leave out a reference to young Clarkson, John Clarkson, Thomas's brother, whom Wilberforce describes as a fine and a very worthy young fellow. They leave out a number of references to how Clarkson and uh, James Ramsey and William Dixon ought to shame me. They shame me. They shame me. Yeah. Um, and then they leave out reference uh, in August of 1789 to uh, Clark's, John Clarks and when they describe Wilberforce's visit to the, the, the Moore sisters. Uh, so Hannah Moore is mentioned to her sister Patty, but John Clarkson's name is just dropped altogether. And then perhaps most significantly of all, in, in April 1790, when Wilberforce says that they are looking over Clarkson's witnesses, in other words, the witnesses that Clarkson has worked so hard to bring together, um, the sons have simply dropped Clarkson's name. So if you go to the official life, what you get is looked over uh, witnesses, not Clarkson's witnesses. 
So there are missing words, missing passages, missing names, uh, which in addition will uh, will fill back back in, so we have a kind of fuller picture. Um, there's another problem, and that's that there are missing volumes. Robert th thankfully made a short list of um, the diaries that he had in his possession in the 1730s. And there are several of these which I've highlighted here in bold, which uh, are no longer extant. Um, in particular, there is a religious journal for 1785-86, which is the, the months immediately following Wilberforce's evangelical conversion, this key turning point in his life. We have extracts from them in the life, uh, but we don't have the original journal. And also, and for historians of abolition, this is particularly uh, unfortunate, we have missing um, diaries for 17, uh, 1792, basically, in the first part of 1793. So a really critical phase when, when the abolition movement, of course, uh, runs into the buffers after its initial success. That section is, that, that part of the diaries is missing, what uh, Robert called book three, but also um, book six. Now we do have some diary for 1802, 03, and the beginning of 04, but uh, 1805, 1806, 1807 is missing. And so we're dependent on the extracts that the sons took out. So it's not clear what happened to these. One possibility is that Robert Wilberforce um, destroyed them, perhaps because he was following his father's instructions, if, if some of the diaries bore a mark for their destruction, or perhaps because after the Clarkson controversy, uh, he, he's worried about potentially incriminating material in, in these diaries if it ever gets out. Um, but of course, it's perfectly possible as well that they've been uh, accidentally thrown out at some later point. Um, or there is still that slight possibility one holds out for that they're still out there somewhere. So in my contacts with the Wilberforce family and descendants, who've been very helpful, they say there are no uh, diaries left in their possession. So um, let me give an overview of what we now know, now that we do have a, a transcription of uh, all of um, the diaries. And hopefully you can see this, and this, this gives um, uh, a, oh, sorry, um, an overview of um, how much we have really per, per year in terms of words over the course of Wilberforce's career. And you can see how relatively uneven it is. So 1779, uh, everything was published, almost 20,000 words about his trip to the Lake District. Then we have that gap in the early years when Wilberforce was an MP, when we don't have um, the diaries. Um, we have very little for 1787, just some extracts from the religious journal. And I put the religious journal here in, in orange and, and the, what, what the sons called the diaries in blue. Though what we have found is generically, the two are no, not as distinct as that distinction suggests, that actually he uses a diary for religious journaling and the journal contains a lot of names and a lot of details about uh, events and so on. Um, but you can see that the balance of that changes. So he's keeping the religious journal quite a bit in the 1780s and 90s. It's a bit more sort of in 1806, 1809, but then really in the later stage of his career, he's not keeping a separate religious journal. So he uses his diaries to do that religious journaling. So we have these gaps, these low points, 1792, uh, the, the period just leading up to the abolition. Uh, and then again, a bit in, in 1823, another important year where, where we have less. But the second half of Wilberforce's career and the mid 1790s are very, very fully uh, chronicled in, in the diaries. So I think actually one of the, the things that will be very, very useful um, about the diaries is that they will help as historians turn their attention, in a sense, towards that second half of the British uh, abolitionist movement after 1808, uh, which is now getting more attention as we move towards the anniversary of um, the founding of the Anti-Slavery Society in 1823. And then, of course, towards the Emancipation Act 10 years later in Wilberforce's death. So the diaries are very full for the second half of Wilberforce's career. And they help us also to see the, the, the turn to the Caribbean as well, I think, in this period. 
Uh, very few references in the 1810s to Barbados or Jamaica, but quite a lot of references to Trinidad and to Berbice, which is, are, of course, the testing ground for amelioration, for the registration bill, for new efforts by the abolitionists. Um, and one of the things that Anna Harrington was working on in her PhD on Wilberforce was uh, the Babise Commission, which, which uh, is, is, I think, a neglected episode in his, um, his career. OK, so that hopefully provides you with a, a useful overview. When we've, altogether, there are about 950,000 words, so almost a million words. We're taking these in three different sources, from diaries, from re religious journals, but also when we don't have the manuscript from the extracts in the official life because we know from um, comparing the extracts with the manuscript that, that the sons uh, were generally reliable, even if they omitted uh, material. So let me talk a little bit about um, what's in the diaries and, and how it might be useful to historians of abolition. Um, now, at first sight, the, the, what the content of the diaries may appear somewhat um, disappointing, I think, to historians of abolition, because Wilberforce uh, had his finger in numerous pies, and abolition was, although it was his great parliamentary cause, um, it's something that has to share space with many other things. He is, for example, a very assiduous um, constituency MP uh, and a tender at the House of Commons and sits on all sorts of committees for canals and uh, turnpikes and so on. Um, he has a lot of material in here about uh, family life, a great deal of material about the quotidian and the everyday, um, the search for a wife, health, diet, vacations, lodgings, those sort of TripAdvisor style reviews of various lodgings and complaints about fleas, uh, religion, he's, he's often reviewing sermons quite negatively. Uh, and actually, in the later stage of the diaries, he's quite literally telling us which way the wind is blowing. He records um, uh, the direction of the wind uh, each day. So there's a lot of extraneous material in there from the point of view of an historian of abolition. Uh, you may find this diary actually quite frustrating. But I think one of the things I'd like to argue is that um, the way in which the Wilberforce diaries uh, contain all sorts of things is actually quite interesting and useful for historians of abolition because it helps us maybe to address certain um, questions um, about how abolition is related to uh, religion, to the economy, um, to, uh, to empire and so on. Um, when you look at the, the diaries, especially after uh, the 1780s, you can see that Wilberforce is using them for sort of self-management. Uh, he keeps time charts for a long period. I think most of us who have to do these things for work uh, do them very reluctantly, uh, but he, he actually voluntarily keeps time charts uh, of how he's using his time as sort of major and minor business meals and relaxation, dressing and undressing. He just takes up to an hour to dress and undress one day. Um, he's a column for squandered, time squandered. And as you can see, just one quarter of an hour in this particular week uh, squandered. And then serious reading, which would be principally, I think, religious reading. You can see how much time he devotes to that, especially on a Sunday, and in this case on Good Friday. Um, <clears throat> so Wilberforce uses the diary as a kind of technology of the self. And you can see here again on this particular page, in one of the folio sheets, observations, resolves, earlier hours, no grand exceedings. Um, men's reg, so table regs, redeem the time, uh, min for, I think this is minimized for fermented uh, drinks, uh, observations of regs, no self debatings and so on. So he's using the diary um, to regulate his own, um, his own life. So the, the di Wilberforce diaries are a good example of how diaries are used for uh, what Michel Foucault once called the care of the self. Um, and we're used, I think, to thinking, you know, the common criticism of abolitionists, of course, is their telescopic philanthropy, that they're uh, focused on um, evils and uh, thousands of miles away from Britain and ignoring what's, what's uh, going on in Britain itself. Um, 
but as well as the telescopic dimension, there is in uh, abolition of spirituality often this sort of microscopic uh, attention to and scrutiny of the soul. A focus on the reformation of the self that you see running from uh, John Woolman through James Stephen to Thomas Val Buxton onto American abolitionists like uh, Angelina Grimke. Um, and Angela Lahr, in a recent study of Angelina Grimke's diary, has noted that the, the religious preoccupation with individual sin and guilt and salvation tends to spill over uh, into uh, a concern with social sin and with collective guilt. So Wilberforce is using his, uh, his diary and especially his religious journal um, to humble himself, to bring himself into the dust. He talks about self-abhorrence and so on. But there's also a sense in which that way of managing the soul, the self, is projected as well onto a national uh, screen, that the message is given to the nation too, that the nation also needs to go through this same uh, process of contrition. So there are interesting ways I think we can link up um, the diaries, use the diaries to sort of link up uh, abolitionist ideas about the self with uh, the abolitionist sort of message to, to the nation. But the diaries are also useful because they record uh, certain periods Wilberforce's uh, reading. Um, so here we've got one example. Uh, you have Burke on the French Revolution, letters from an English lady in France, uh, many letters, uh, presumably that Wilberforce himself is writing, newspapers, Moore's Edward, uh, and getting scripture by heart walking. In other words, he's memorizing parts of the Bible while walking. Voltaire's Condide Rapidly. So this is quite an eclectic program of reading. You know, he's reading the Bible, he's reading a novel, he's reading the newspapers, he's reading Burke and he's reading Voltaire. Um, and that is not untypical of the, the intellectual diet, if you like, of Wilberforce uh, in the 1780s, 90s and, and onwards. Um, and I think it's important because quite often we think about Wilberforce as primarily a religious reformer, a uh, religiously motivated figure. Uh, and I don't think that's wrong, but it's also very important to register his wider reading. In particular, he's very well read in Enlightenment texts, especially histories. He's very fond of having uh, Robertson's America or Hume's England read to him while he's dressing. Um, and uh, he, he's also well read in uh, the Scottish Enlightenment in particular. Um, and in Scottish Enlightenment works about uh, the stadial process of reform in, the, in, in history, the different stages that, uh, uh, of development that societies go through. So he's well read in Adam Smith and in Adam Ferguson, uh, Hume's essays and so on. So he's, this is a reminder of the way in which the abolitionist movement is powerfully informed by Scottish Enlightenment ideas, including ideas of gradual uh, emancipation and the civilizing process as well that needs to be exported to Africa in the minds of uh, many abolitionists. But he's also a keen reader of novels through his Korea, um, uh, you know, Goldsmith and Fielding and Richardson and Henry Mackenzie uh, here, uh, Moore's Edward, um, and he's steeped in that uh, language of sensibility and sentiment that Brook and Carey and others have emphasised is so important to abolitionism. So even some of the, if you like, extraneous material in the in the diaries, which might not seem directly relevant to historians of abolition, I think is actually quite quite interesting and and useful. But one of the things that, that Wilberforce always does with his diary, so the diary morphs quite a lot over time. Um, at times, you know, you, you've got a reading journal, a health journal, a time charts, a parliamentary journal, uh, a religious journal. But the thing that's consistent from 1779 to 1833 is that Wilberforce is recording, systematically recording the names of the people he meets and the places he goes to. And I think this is one of the most valuable things about it in terms of uh, showing us um, abolitionist networks and the, and the networks, especially of uh, of the Wilberforce circle. Uh, it shows us the different places uh, in which Wilberforce worked and built connections. Um, he does, of course, move in elite circles 
uh, throughout his career. Uh, Thomas Carlyle, later rather snidely called Wilberforce, a drawing room Christian, because he does spend a lot of his life in drawing rooms. Uh, he has his own uh, accommodation uh, in the early career at Palace Yard, Old Palace Yard in Westminster, um, but is very fond of uh, going to Bath and taking the waters and the, the pump room. Um, he's also, of course, familiar with large public meetings, such as those held in Freemasons Hall and other venues. But it's the country house and uh, the way in which uh, out of parliamentary session, he moves around country houses and makes connections with uh, many of the elite, which uh, I think the diary really chronicles um, very fully. So what we see is a constant stream of people, MPs, peers, gentry, aristocracy, bankers, merchants, um, uh, bishops, clergy, dissenters, philanthropists, reformers, scientists, medics, writers, intellectuals, they parade through the pages of Wilberforce's diary. And we also, uh, Gareth Atkins recently in his book, Converting Britannia, about evangelicals and British public life in this era, reminds us um, that uh, although the abolitionist movement is particularly known for its uh, new forms of mobilization, uh, mass petitioning and, and pressure methods and so on, um, there is, uh, they're also, uh, the evangelicals are also using much more traditional sort of Georgian methods of, uh, of leverage. And there's a great deal of emphasis on patronage and access to um, key figures. So Wilberforce emerges from the diary as um, an assiduous networker, and we've never really been able to see his networks uh, anything like as fully as we can with the full diary. And one thing we're trying to do as well is put together a catalogue of his correspondence so we can cross-reference those two. So together they give us a really uh, full uh, view of both his personal networks, people he meets face to face, and also those um, whom he corresponds with. And we can begin to pull together, pull out threads in the diary about his connections to the leading statesmen of the day, people like George Grenville and uh, Lord Apsley, later Lord Bathurst, at the top, he, of course, becomes colonial secretary. Um, these are people who he would have known as a young MP in the early 1780s, but keeps connections with over the, the decades. And you, we can now kind of follow through some of these threads or the younger generation of statesmen like William Broom, the, the Whig uh, MP, or George, uh, George Canning. So the diaries are made up, if you like, of a tapestry of thousands of different threads of people that he knows, and we can begin to sort of assemble and tell stories about uh, some of those individual figures. And they help us to think about Wilberforce's inner circle. Um, one thing that struck me again doing sort of word searches through the transcription is just how prominent the Stevens are. Um, and this is not surprising, of course. James Stephen marries Wilberforce's widowed sister, Sally. Um, so he's, he's literally part of the family, but he's also a really, really critical uh, advisor uh, to Wilberforce from the late 1790s onwards. And his sons, of course, George and James Jr. are gonna play really critical roles in the abolitionist movement uh, in the, the late 1820s and uh, 1830s, much more important than the Wilberforce sons. And while the Wilberforce sons are always respectful, towards James Stephen. Uh, I, I'm not sure that they really give due weight uh, to him. Uh, there's a lot to be said for David Bryan Davis's view that, that Stephen really is the, the sort of key, the key sort of mastermind of the abolition of the, the slave trade. Um, and he's a continues to be a very important figure. And one thing you see, and, and this often isn't printed in the, the official life, is um, James Stephen pressuring Wilberforce into moving abolition up his very busy agenda. So in 1811, for example, Wilberforce resolves to attend more to Stephen and especially to abolition and Negro matters. Oh, I deserve reproach most justly here. I have always been too cool about abolition business, forgetting too much its superior importance. Dear Stephen has most kindly reprehended me off them. So we get this impression of Wilberforce who's overstretched, uh, working on numerous different projects, uh, religious, philanthropic, political, um, 
and constantly having to be brought back to uh, abolition by figures who are more resolutely focused on it, in particular Stephen and, uh, and Zachary McCauley. So the, the diaries help us with Wilberforce's inner circle. And then finally, they open up to connections to the, 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 the colonial world. Um, and uh, it, it's intriguing how a lot of figures flit in and out. We, we get a sense of how the Wilberforce circle knows about the world of the empire, not just by um, reading newspapers or journals or parliamentary reports, but also through personal connections, constant visits from uh, missionaries and from colonial officials and travelers uh, and black activists as well at points. Um, it was only recently, for example, I just uh, realized that Wilberforce personally meets uh, Simon Bolivar on a couple of occasions um, in I think 1811 is it when, when Bolivar is visiting uh, uh, London as one of the Venezuelan deputies uh, and meets uh, General Miranda who's on good terms with Wilberforce and uh, comes along to see him and Miranda and Bolivar and the other Venezuelan deputies have to wait in Kensington Gore on the veranda uh, on the site of what's now the Albert Hall waiting for the Wilberforce family to uh, finish their family prayers before they they come in and and see them. Wilberforce also records meeting young Toussaint, somebody he calls young Toussaint, who presumably is one of uh, Louverture's um, uh, sons, perhaps Isaac or Placide, who were, were in France at this time. And he, he recounts being initially skeptical about this meeting, uh, but then being increasingly persuaded that this, this person is who he says he is. And of course, the Wilberforce Circle are quite intrigued by Toussaint and James Stephen actually writes a, a biography of him. And then another figure who Wilberforce sees a lot more of is Prince Saunders, the African-American abolitionist who uh, is sent out to Haiti uh, during the period where they're corresponding with Henri Christophe, uh, trying to set up uh, a school system in, in Haiti. So we meet, you know, there are over 30 references to Prince Saunders in the, in, in the diary. And I don't think he's mentioned, uh, none of these figures actually are mentioned at all in the, uh, the official life. And Wilberforce biographers have tended to overlook them. So there's a sense in which this project this is, of course, going to focus rather uh, um, obsessively on one person, on William Wilberforce. Uh, and there's always a bit of a danger of monomania with, with any uh, research project. But it will also, I think, open up uh, to a much wider global world and a much wider set of connections uh, and open up the biographies and the significance of a lot of individuals as we go through and annotate the diaries. So I hope, I hope that's given you uh, a basic introduction to the diaries and some initial thoughts about how they might be useful to historians of abolition. But I'll pass back to uh, Trevor at this point. Thank you very much, John, for that um, absolutely fascinating uh, presentation. Um, it's, it's very interesting to see, uh, see how you're dealing with what looks to be a, a very difficult text. The first page wasn't too bad, but um, it's, it's swiftly declined after that particular period. Um, and to give us an idea of uh, many of the things that are, that that, um, that, that, dealt, that Wilberforce deals with, and, and uh, it's, it's absolutely certain, I think, that when you get to publish this diary, we'll get a, a new, fuller, and, and, and better picture of this of this particular man, this particular man, uh, and his and the movement that he was so important in in, in leading. Um, if can I just remind people if they'd like to send some questions, we have got some questions already coming in. Uh, but if you'd like to send some questions, if you could do so. Um, through the chat function, and uh, they'll, they'll be passed on to me, and I'll I'll, I'll present them to to John. Um, we have a few questions, John, if you're willing to to answer them. Uh, the first question comes from Sia Fleury, uh, who says that you mentioned the fourth the forthcoming bicentenary uh, of Wilberforce's death, and also I guess the bicentenary of the abolition of slavery uh, mm -hmm. in 2033. Um, what role, she asked, do you think these diaries can play in marking that anniversary? Uh, and in marking that anniversary and telling the story of the route to abolition in a way that might inspire people to tackle modern slavery. Yeah, so there's obviously an interesting history of um, the commemoration of these anniversaries, which John Oldfield, of course, has, has written about particularly and, and the way in which um, the anniversaries of, and the way Wilberforce particularly was remembered. So um, 
I think it's interesting if we, if we think about 1807, there's been a great deal of academic uh, reflection on 1807 uh, and the, um, the 2007, the bicentenary of the abolition of the slave trade and how that was remembered. And of course, there was an accusation that um, it was something of a Wilberfest uh, or, or even a Wilber farce. So uh, th there's a certain nervousness about um, putting Wilberforce up front and center, which is quite understandable. Uh, my sense with, with 2007 is it actually did begin to sort of open things up a lot more. Uh, and, and in that sense, it was a, a good occasion for historians really to uh, showcase a lot of the, the newer research on the, the wider dimensions of the abolitionist movement. So while Wilberforce was marked, and of course there was a sort of Hollywood biopic and so on, and by various biographies, including William Hague's, um, it was also a real opportunity to open up the story much more um, widely. Um, and I think that is increasingly happening and hopefully that that will happen again with 1823 and 1833, because actually I think it is quite important that historians get out to the public, the, the complexity of what's going on here, um, because often the story of uh, Wilberforce is told in a, in a sort of simple heroic mode. Um, and we need to think in a, in a more sophisticated way, I suppose, about how social movements operate. Um, this, this, in some ways, is, is the mother of all uh, social, social movements. It's, uh, it's, it's been this sort of model for many, many later ones. And its success, of course, has, has appealed greatly. But we also need to think about um, its limitations, the things they don't achieve. We need to think, and I think Matthew Taylor's new book, The Interest, is very good at this. We need to think again about what they were up against the enormous resistance to uh, emancipation within, um, among the British establishment. Um, we need to think about how they cautiously found their way towards emancipation, uh, you know, after first of all focusing on the abolition of the slave trade, then on amelioration, then on gradual emancipation, and then only finally really in the early 1830s, immediate emancipation. This was a long and difficult journey for these activists as they thought about the practicalities of how you implement emancipation uh, peacefully, um, something they don't have a great deal of uh, models for or how, how you do that in a slave society. So I, I think it is a real, the anniversaries can be a real opportunity for us thinking through some of the different issues and those are relevant I think to, to those who are concerned about uh, modern day slavery as well. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Elizabeth Alborn, um, who, who first of all wants to congratulate you for the, for the webinar. So it was very interesting. Uh, but she's very interested in, she wants to, to ask a question about Southern Africa and the Cape Colony. Um, is there a significant amount of material in the diaries about the Cape Colony and about Southern Africa? And if there is material in there, how would you characterize the Southern African network? Yeah, well, well uh, great to get that question, and I very much enjoyed uh, Blood Ground's tr uh, terrific, terrific book on on the Cape Cape Colony, which is really sort of eye, eye opening, and uh, I learned a huge amount from that. Um, yeah, there is there is a certain amount, and obviously, you know, he has contact M missionaries. I mean, one thing I think comes across in the diaries is how important missionaries are uh, to to Wilberforce in terms of um, his understanding of what's going on in the Caribbean but also in, in Southern Africa and elsewhere. Um, and so he does have contact, obviously, with John Philip in, in, in particular. Um, so there are references to uh, um, Southern Africa in the diary. I need to go back and, and check a bit more because uh, uh, just uh, instant recall, I, I, I can't tell you too much about that. Um, but um, yeah, the, the, that, that's something we'll follow up. I, I think one of the one of the advantages of a, an edition is um, that the diary itself is often quite um, uh, brief, concise, um, often frustratingly so. So he tells you who he's meeting, what he's reading. Uh, you know, he do, he does read, I think, some of John Phillips' um, um, uh, his, his book about about Southern Africa. Um, but uh, one of the things we can do in annotating the edition is start to fill that out a bit more so that actually the, the, the edition is, um, uh, is really useful in pointing uh, readers towards, towards the larger 
the largest story. So it's not, um, yeah, it's it's not one of his major preoccupations, but it is something that he's, he's conscious of um, from, I think, the, the 1810s onwards and into the 1830s and something that he's concerned about. And of course, does give parliamentary, does give us a, a substantial parliamentary speech on it in the early 1820s. Great, thank you, thank you very much. We've got a, a question from, from Gary Craig, which I think is very pertinent. Um, Gary asks, just just wait a second, I get this question back up here. Um, Gary wanted to ask about, uh, that, 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 that some of Wilberforce's comments about slaves, especially after 1807, mm -hmm. uh, Gary notes were profoundly ra racist and in sharp contradiction to his implicit views of slaves in the abolition campaign. Is there any indication in his diaries of him struggling uh, with these contradictions? Yeah, so on the one hand, Wilberforce uh, is deeply committed to uh, the inherent equality of all human beings. All human souls are, are equal before God. Uh, and he doesn't believe that uh, Africans are intellectually inferior to Europeans, which is something, of course, that plenty of his contemporaries, an idea that plenty of his contemporaries do flirt with. So in that sense, he's if you like, anti anti racist. But he does, of course, also think that um, uh, England and other European societies are lead societies and that other societies need to play catch up and that there. And this is why I think the Scottish Enlightenment ideas about stadial history, the different stages of development of different cultures uh, is such an important thing for understanding if, if we're to understand the, the abolitionist movement and the way they think about uh, colonization. So in that sense, he does have this um, condescending attitude towards uh, towards Africans. Um, there's not there's not a lot of reflection on uh, race in, in the diary itself. I think the place to go for that really would be to the parliamentary speeches and to the correspondence. And that's why one of the th things we're, we're wanting to do as we annotate the diary is to cross reference between the diaries and his correspondence and speeches so that readers can actually follow up uh, key speeches. Uh, and, and that's where you will get Wilberforce's um, ideas about race being being developed more fully rather than in the, the diaries themselves. Um, he doesn't he does, as I said, meet um, black activists at various points, but they are fairly marginal. They flit in and out of uh, the story. So there isn't, you know, um, uh, he's not collaborating with them that much. I mean, uh, so, so Prince Saunders is is uh, an exception in that regard. So, for example, allowed Equiano, famous figure in this period. There's no record in the diaries or elsewhere of Wilberforce and Equiano ever meeting. Um, though, of course, we do have some missing years there, so you, you, you never know what what was in the the bits that we're uh, bits that we're missing. Um, and he, he sometimes can seem to be somewhat dismissive. So there's, uh, he, he talks at one point about meeting William Allen, the Quaker activist, uh, who he calls a, a truly great and good man, which is something that the um, the sons omit from their extra extract. Um, but that, then he also says that he came with his black. Uh, and I think what he means by that is he came with Paul Cuffey, the, uh, the uh, African-American Quaker. Uh, abolitionist who's involved in colonization movements. So uh, I think there's more, to, there is work to be done there in terms of analyzing Wilberforce's language. But I think really for his views on race, you need to move to the, the speeches and to the to the letters. And also, of course, to his own books on the abolition of the slave trade and on slavery in the early uh, 1820s. Well, there's a couple of questions from Richard Hussey, one of which he says is flippant, but I don't think it is. I think it's actually a very interesting question. Uh, and the other one, which he calls a more serious one, which is indeed serious. Um, the one which he describes as a flippant, flippant one, but I think I think everybody would be very interested in your answer to this. Uh, what is your, the biggest surprise? Not necessarily the most important research finding, but what is the biggest surprise that you have encountered uh, in doing this, this research? Um, and the second question is, um, given the balance of slavery to other issues like uh, mission, repression of radicalism, et cetera. Does the balance of slavery to other issues tell us anything about William Wilberforce's priorities and also to the ways in which his abolitionism has obscured 
or even distorted his wider political and his wider church career? Mm. So two mm. questions. Yeah, yeah. Ironically, I think it's probably the second one that I, could, I might find easier to answer than the first. Um, so yeah, I, I think it, yeah. This one of the things this the diary emphasizes, I think, is that we do need to put. Although Wilberforce is famous really for his abolitionism, that's the thing that that makes his his name really. Um, when you read the diaries, you do see how abolition fits into a much larger set of projects, um, and and to an, in some ways an even greater set of ambitions. Uh, one of the things I'm working on at the moment actually is an essay about abolitionist um, millennialism, you know, so their their belief that the which is shared by many American abolitionists as well, that, that they are living in the era in which the, the kingdom, the rule of God is going to spread throughout the earth. Uh, and this, I, I think, is very important for all kinds of reform movements. Uh, it's important also for things like the peace movement that the Clarkson brothers are involved in, the expectation that, say, war could be eradicated. From the world if you're a millennialist that's that's a might be a plausible kind of ambition um wilberforce is also a millennialist he, he also thinks that uh that the rule of god is spreading he expects christianization to to uh, spread out uh, ripple out globally so for him the abolition of the slave trade and then eventually emancipation are i think part of this much larger um almost cosmic vision of, of millennial reform um, and so, in a sense, what, what you see in the diaries is that abolition is, is important to him, but it is part of something, something larger as well and needs to be understood in that sort of religious context. Uh, what's been most surprising? I, I, I would actually say not one, one thing. I would say it's a little, it's a little details, and I think this is where annotating the diaries is actually going to be quite exciting. So it's often the little uh finds that you come across it's it's realizing for example that bolivar was on that veranda with general miranda in 1811 wait, waiting outside to see wilberforce uh it, it's it's picking up on um uh little exchanges and incidents he has been able to for example reconstruct conversations from the other side of the conversation where wilberforce gives you a very very brief account but you go to another journal or diary and somebody's described it more fully so i guess for me as an editor uh, it's often those little serendipitous finds that are the really interesting ones. And I think they bring things to life and they also often point away from Wilberforce to other people, to other stories that have been forgotten and that are uh, are very interesting. Thanks. I have a question from Barry Longstaff, who's uh, with, with the Wilberforce Lodge and indeed has been instrumental in bringing together some very important meetings between the three lodges, Freemasons lodges named after Wilberforce in um, Hull, Croydon, and uh, Freetown and Sierra Leone. Uh, and I guess he asked a question which, 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 which comes from this particular, particular activity. Uh, he's interested in if there's any mention of Freemasons Hall attendance and perhaps any mention of possible Freemasons that he associated with. And perhaps you could expand to talk about Freemasonry in general in, in Wilberforce's work. Yeah. I mean, this this is where uh, having me back in five years time, Trevor, will probably <laughs> uh, I'll be able to answer some of these questions more fully once once we've annotated it. Um, I did mention Prince Saunders there, actually. Prince Saunders is an interesting figure because he, he founds a, a black Masons at Masonic Lodge in Boston. So there is this sort of African-American uh, branch of Freemasonry. Um, I, yeah, I, I've not looked into this and Wilberforce's connections with uh, Freemasonry in Britain. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure uh, what I would find there. But Freemasons Hall is used for certain meetings, most famously in 1830 for the major meeting of the Anti-Slavery Society, uh, which uh, a rather obscure figure, Pownall, stands up and presses them towards some sort of immediate emancipation measures. Uh, at least for those who are born into slavery, that they should be declared immediately emancipated. And uh, Wilberforce is at that meeting. Um, there's a great furore about it because um, Pownall and others are basically demanding that the that the uh, the anti-slavery society moves away to gradualism to immediatism. So that's one uh, one case in which they're they're using Freemasons Hall in in London. But I think yeah, that's another strand of research that I hadn't really thought about, but it, but it's uh, some it's worth worth following through on.
Well, great. Well, we will have you back in five years, and perhaps Barry can answer that question again in that stage. A question that, 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 that I think you'll find pretty interesting as well is from John Oldfield, uh, of course, who, who we well know for his work on abolitionism. Um, he wanted to ask a question about Wilberforce as a politician and wants to ask you, to what extent do you think the diaries help us to understand what sort of politician he was? And he, he adds a couple other things here. As to what extent is he led by people like Stephen and Macaulay? To what use does he put all of this assiduous networking? Yeah, yeah. No, so I, I think it's hard to assess Wilberforce as, as a, a politician. I mean, some of his, the more hagiographical studies of Wilberforce say that, you know, uh, the world was his oyster and if he'd wanted to become prime minister, he could have. And I think that's quite naive. Um, it's interesting if you compare, say, Wilberforce's diary to Gladstone's, um, there's more of a sense of command and control, I think, in, in Gladstone. Wilberforce's diary and some of the pages I showed you show somebody who's struggling to stay on top of of everything I and mean, he has a huge mailbag i mean he's inundated uh with visitors um he's got all kinds of demands on his time he is though quite a professional politician in the sense that he lives in west in parliamentary session he lives in westminster during the week uh, and then he goes back home uh, sometimes in the evening but uh, but more more often at the, at the weekend uh, even when he lives in kensington gore and hyde park uh he tends to live in uh, during the week in Westminster so that he can attend parliamentary sessions, uh, take part in debates, but also sit on all of these um, pretty, to us, pretty dull committees. You know, so so we, we think of Wilberforce for these grandstanding moments, but he's involved in a great deal of um, relatively dull parliamentary work. Um, so he is, in that sense, a fairly exemplary backbencher. Um, and I guess the question of, of, of the networking and, and how he puts that to work, I, you know, my sense, I suppose, is that he does cultivate a whole series of different networks. You know, so there's networks in Yorkshire, there are philanthropic uh, networks, uh, there are religious networks, uh, with missionary societies and so on and so forth, the Bible Society. Um, and that in a sense, his, his repute in those different uh, arenas is something that he could potentially leverage at key moments. For example, when they're lobbying for a ban on the, the European Atlantic slave trade and, and diplomacy in the mid 1810s, um, uh, it, it helps that, you know, he, he has built his reputation in these different these different fields. So in, in many ways, I think he is a, a really serious politician, even though he's um, uh, different from the, 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 the statesman, you know, some of these younger figures uh, that, that he knew in the 1780s, you go on to stellar parliamentary careers. Uh, Wilberforce always sits on the back benches. He's never, of course, a government minister, but he is a, a very assiduous uh, MP and a very assiduous networker. Right, take, um, I'll, perhaps I'll take the liberty of asking a question uh, from, the, from the chair and, and, and also one which is um, uh, connected to, to things I've been thinking about as, as someone who's used a diary himself and, and, and written a book on a person who wrote a diary of about a million words as well, so similar sort of size or a little lot easier to, to, to read, which is that of Thomas Thistlewood of Lincolnshire. Earlier, it's an earlier one, of course. Um, but one of the differences, of course, between Wilberforce's diary and Thistlewood's diary uh, is that Wilberforce's diary is a diary of a public man that you might expect mm. that it might be read. And it's, it's interesting that he chose, he, he, he expresses views about how it's not to be read. Now, nowadays, of course, we expect di uh, politicians to write diaries. Um, I'm not quite sure if Boris does, but uh, you, you'd presume that Keir Starmer and uh, Michael Gove uh, are assiduously writing their diaries. Um, so that they can write books later on and also prove that they were right about everything uh, while they were, were doing th doing this. You don't get that sense from the extracts that you've given from Wilberforce's diary. To, to what extent did, did the diary change as Wilberforce became more famous? And to what extent is Wilberforce writing his diaries in a very conscious way? Why does he write his diaries? Why does he keep it? It's not, it's not, a, not a thing that normally people do keep a diary like this for such a long time. Yeah, yeah. 
And as I said, it, it is an interesting diary because it does change form quite significantly. Um, so, you know, in the, if you take 1783 to 86, it really is a, a record of people and um, events. After his religious conversion, you're, you're suddenly getting this, uh, the, the, the use of the diary for religious journaling, um, for timekeeping, for, you know, record of his, his diet and health and so on. Um, so it becomes much more this care of the self and uh, self-management. So it does evolve over over the years. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting why he, he he doesn't seem to revisit it very much. And this is one thing the sons say. I mean, he does sometimes revisit uh, parts of the religious journal uh, because he has resolutions in there and he goes back to look at his resolutions and, and how much he's kept them or not, not kept them. Um, but I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, struck by how much he doesn't, he, he doesn't seem to go back over the diary very much. So then the question is, why has he, um, why has he kept it, and uh, what, what's the intention with it? And I, I think there, there, he does at one point later, later in his career, thinking about writing his own life, and I think he's also thinking about family potentially writing official memoirs, and this is another reason to maintain a diary so that they have access to that. And that will help them to write it. So I, th I think there is an element of um, life writing here and some consciousness that this may be useful uh, at a later time. Perhaps also just for correspondence purposes, um, it's useful to have a record of when you met people. Um, you know, so just for practical business, just keeping a brief record of of meetings uh, could could be useful. But I don't think he ever stands back and provides a. a an account of why he started keeping a diary or what his purpose was in it. Um, and as I said, it, he, he's, it changes over the years. He uses it for different, for different things. Thanks, John. We have a, we have a final question, uh, which comes from Nick Evans from the Wilberforce Institute. Um, and Nick wants to ask a question of considerable contemporary relevance. He asks, um, there's been a great deal of debate in Scotland, I'm sure you're aware of this, John, as well as Nick is, uh, about, Wil about Wilberforce's view of Henry Dundas and his ideas about gradual abolition. Um, is it possible, Nick asked, to obtain from these sources uh, any view about whether Wilberforce thought favourably about Dundas? Um, well, I mean, he, he knows Dundas well from Pitt's circle in the, in the mid-1780s when they were both very young politicians so you know this this you know, Dundas is somebody he knows well um he does blame Dundas for scuppering uh immediate abolition of the slave trade in 1792 when Dundas famously proposes to insert the word gradual um and to uh and, and of course you know parliament votes so the commons vote at that point for for abolition to be postponed to 1796 and then it's deferred beyond that so he he does uh he does blame dundas um and of course dundas is also uh, one of the people really promoting britain's uh in, invasion as well of of uh of haiti in the uh of saint domingue in the 1790s which uh is something that wilberforce will also um uh be, be critical of, of of dundas for it, it's interesting because the you know he he does tend to these people maintain relationships even when they've had uh, fairly fierce disagreements. So there there are a number of occasions in which later on he uh, you know he meets Dundas at dinners and so on after 1792. They they have a little bit of of, of interaction, um, but I think Wilberforce's view. I mean, some of Dundas's uh, defenders in recent days have, have said that Dundas was an abolitionist. Um, and that's certainly not how Wilberforce thinks of Dundas. Uh, he, he thinks of him as somebody who is essentially working with and for the West Indian lobby. Um, so he sees him as an, uh, essentially an opponent, an obstructor of, uh, of abolition. Um, so yeah, the, the diaries do give us, do give us some, uh, some indication of that. Great, thanks. Um, John Oldfield has a, has a question, another question, which, uh, I think is very appropriate for to today. Um, he'd, he'd like us to think about both 1833 and 2033. Um, can you give us any idea, John asks, how often slavery appears in the diaries, the word slavery, uh, between 18, 1826 when Wilberforce stands down as an MP, 
1833 when he dies? Not very much. That, that's a good question, John. Um, and of course, I, you know, it's interesting. I mean, Wilberforce is still this figure to conjure with in public debate, and he gets appealed to by different sides, but he also gets appealed to in an unfortunate way in some of the contemporary debates over Black Lives Matter and race, in which people will come out with the line, it was a white man who abolished slavery. You know, of course, they're invoking Wilberforce as, as, if, as if he abolished slavery single handedly. Um, of course, Wilberforce is retired from Parliament for almost a decade by the time the Emancipation Act is brought in. Um, and yes, yeah, slavery is not really a prominent theme in the diary in those final years. I mean, it, it does come up and he has conversations with uh, Thomas Fowle Buxton, for example, comes to um, to see him. So he continues to have conversations with with these people, James uh, Stephen Jr., who, of course, is uh, going to be one of the drafters of the Emancipation Act is also an executor of Wilberforce's uh, will. And so he, you know, he, he is still seeing some of the really main players, but he is also off to the <laughs> side. I mean, he's, he still remains a figurehead. His name is constantly invoked, uh, not least in the Caribbean and by the West Indian lobby. Uh, you know, the, the name Wilberforce still has this resonance as, as, the, as the figure who uh, um, represents the anti, anti-slavery movement. But in those final years, um, the, the issue is relatively marginal to to the diaries, you know, af- after Wilberforce retires from Parliament in 1825. Great, thank you. Um, Karina Turman, who thanks you for the great talk, as many of the uh, many of the questioners have have done, um, wants to ask a question which follows on some of the previous questions, and she asks, what can the diaries tell us about Wilberforce and how he identifies himself in terms of Britishness and in terms of character? Was she was he practicing? She asked this kind of self awareness. So yeah, Wilberforce is he quite often exp- on a number of occasions he expresses gratitude that he was born in England in the 18th century, um, and one reason for that is he says that if he'd been born in earlier ages, uh, he he was a rather frail child and would almost certainly not have made it into adulthood. Um, but there is this sense of gratitude of being born at this place at this time and this sense of patriotism. Um, and of course, it's part of the reason for his success uh, at a high political level that he and other elite abolitionists are trying to think about how they can present abolition as something that's in the national interest. Um, that, that's something that Wilberforce works out very, very hard. So he does have this. Um, this strong sense of uh, a relatively conservative patriotism, and uh, and he when he talks about Pitt, he tends to talk about Pitt in these terms uh, that, that he sees Pitt as genuinely having the the, the, the country's interest, the nation's interest um, at heart. He sees Pitt as a true patriot, even though on, on occasions he disagrees with Pitt over things like the war against France than initially. Uh, and over abolition as well at uh, uh, points, um, he nevertheless sees Pitt as a patriot. So, the, so the language of patriotism is is important, I think, to uh, to these elite abolitionists, or, or certainly to Wilberforce, because the, this is one way in which Wilberforce and Clarkson are often separated. In, in that Clarkson's politics uh, are more sympathetic to the French, the French Revolution in its early in its early phases. And this is something actually Dundas warns Wilberforce about. Watch your friend Clarkson, you know, he's bringing discredit to, to, your, to your movement. So um, there are clearly one important thing to say here, of course, is that it's, it, it would be a mistake to just extrapolate from Wilberforce to the whole abolitionist movement. The abolitionist movement is this complex coalition. It's an ecumenical coalition. It involves people of quite different political stances. But Wilberforce's style of abolitionism is very much, this is in the national interest. Uh, and, and I am a pa- patriot, and that's why I'm supporting um, the abolition of the slave trade. Well, great, it's great, John. I think there are many more questions that people could ask, but we'll um, we'll, we'll, we'll probably put, we'll, we'll finish it uh, pretty much here. Um, just before I, I thank John for this fantastic talk, which is very tantalizing, really makes us want, makes us want eager to see uh, the finished work. 
Uh, just to say a couple of things to the audience um, to, for, about this year and about the, the Wilberforce Institute. Uh, this is our last seminar of the of the of the year. We will have uh, more seminars in, in the future. Uh, we certainly in in, in 2021. We're starting one. We'll probably have one in January, but we certainly will have one in in March, which we'll we'll, we'll send some information about that uh, to you soon. In fact, it will come up soon uh, it, it, as a slide. Um, on the 18th of March, uh, a, a webinar on the, about uh, on the road to eradication, uh, reflections on a de decade of anti-slavery efforts in the, new, the United United Kingdom um, by Clara Skirovakova, uh, Grants Manager for Trust for London. Um, just to say, say, say a couple of things. Firstly, to thank the many people who've joined us on these webinars. We, I, we, know we, we now have a regular number of attenders uh, and, and the number of attendees has always been gratifyingly large. Uh, not only people who come from uh, the Wilberforce Institute, uh, from a wider community at Hull, uh, but, from, but from various places in, in Britain uh, and also from around the world. So thank you very much for attending. I hope you find these things very, very useful. Uh, one of the things in this very curious year that we've been doing is to uh, is to expand our online activities, uh, not only in terms of giving these these webinars, but also in in having a blog, uh, the Wilberforce Institute blog, uh, being more active on social media, Twitter, Instagram, those sorts of things, uh, and also through through newsletters. And just I recommend to you, there's a lot of information in the recent Wilberforce newsletter. If you haven't received that, please be in touch and we would like to send it to you. Uh, so thank you very much to the audience for attending. And, and thank you very much to John for uh, what has been a, a wonderful talk uh, on, on, a, on a subject which, of course, uh, is extremely close uh, to our hearts. We like to know more about Wilberforce uh, and everything about him uh, and, and about the diaries and this particular project uh, is going to be in a massive addition to not only to the study of William Wilberforce, uh, but to the study of abolition uh, and to the study of the eradication of slavery, which is absolutely central to the purpose of the Wilberforce Institute. Um, so thank you very much, John. Thank you very much to the audience. Uh, and it leaves me just to say thank you again uh, to everybody who's been involved with this and to wish you all the best for the festive season uh, and to see you back here uh, possibly in January, but certainly in, in, in March uh, for more webinars uh, with the Wilberforce Institute. Thank you very much.